John Wesley is going to join us at 3 o'clock and he's going to tell us about his work in physics in relation to the etheric body and the kind of work he does here with the patients. I thought it was a good opportunity. He came in and wondered whether we would like to hear something about it and I thought, well, yeah, we're, we're studying the etheric body now and this would be just fine. And we can see how it fits in with the occultism. So he'll come at three. Who is he? He's the scientist that works here with Finn. And he seems to come once a week or twice a week and works with patients in various ways. So I thought that would be interesting. And then uh, he says his lecture is only a half hour or so, but you know how those things go. So maybe after that we will have our closing little meditation downstairs. We'll see how far we get right now. I wonder if we can close that door, however. I would... Um, <clears throat> thank you. Okay. So let's see where we were. Okay. So we've been talking about, let's just quickly review. Um, there is one intelligent life. It's, uh, it creates its own, uh, through its meditation, it creates a thought form. The thought form has various um, characteristics. The law of attraction brings it into effect. Many little entities uh, compose it. They are attracted by the mind of the divine creator. Uh, the form is the externalization of something the creator has the creator has visualized the form, colored the form, vitalized the form um, and held the form in shape as long as it needed to perform a specific work it just depends has he released the form uh, the thread and he's connected himself to the form The interior purpose of the form is potent on the physical plane and performs, as they say, it performs, uh, it performs, as long as it remains consciously in the Creator's thought, as long as it keeps its distance occultly from the Creator, so it's not too close to the Creator. This form can be directed in any desired direction. I can find its own place. Let's see, is that where we... We haven't gone this far yet. No, I don't think we've gone this far, is that correct? Michael? Yes. They, they say that the moon is the result of an ancient thought form. To what degree is... Uh, no, it's is a, that so with it, the Earth and the other planets? It's all so, but the, the thing that is said about the moon is that its effect is an ancient thought form effect. It, it's, its effect is the effect of an ancient thought form and not of its radiation. Okay. So that's how I understand it. That it's not. I mean, of course, every planet is the result of a uh, of a of a thought process. Yeah. That goes without saying. But he's basically saying the moon has no radiation of its own. Mm -hmm. And, but there has been a thought form, thought forms created in relation to the moon, and the moon's present cycles correlate, I think, with the changing of those thought forms. The, the, the potentizing or subsiding of the still existent thought forms created in relation to the moon. And it's those thought forms that have the effect. And they are, they are rhythmically keyed to the moon's cycles still. Okay, uh, so this uh, thought form can be directed in any direction and under the law of least resistance, which by the way another name for the law of least resistance is law of economy, finds its own place thus performing its desired function carrying out the purpose for which it was created. So you know how it is if you try to send a thought form forth along a line of greatest resistance it will meet resistance. So the thought form should, the, the, let's just say this uh, the way should be cleared for the thought form uh, its way prepared by right positioning of the thought form so that it does not meet 
with countless obstructions which prevent its mission from being successful. Okay. <clears throat> the formula, therefore, might be regarded as the idea emanating from the divine thinker. It might be defined as the dynamic purpose, the thing, as the thinker sees it and externalizes it in his mind and visualizes it as the carrier of his intent. So this is a um, this is a high definition of the word formula. <clears throat> it is not yet rendered into word. Uh, it is an idea. So that's one way of, of, of thinking about the idea which has to be implemented as a thought. The ego does this as the magician does this as well. Many different definitions of the word formula. The whole uh, mathematical idea of it being written out for execution is a little bit lower than this idea. Different thoughts about the meaning of the word formula. But suffice it to say, it always uh, is economical in expression and says a lot with a little. Those are generally the things about formulas. You know, if you look at maybe the most famous formula of the 20th century, it's just like that, e equals mc squared. And it says uh, a world of thought and relations in the smallest uh, amount of space. The mathematics which underlie the construction of a bridge, such as any of the great spans which signalize human achievement, convey not to the uninitiated, but to those who know and understand, they are the bridge itself, reduced to essential terms. So, that's a very good idea. The, let's just say, the formula is the idea itself. Uh, that which is to be manifested, reduced to essential terms. And so the formula is the reality, and the bridge is the outer effect. The formula is the reality, and the thought form is the outer effect. The formula is the idea, or reality, and the thought form created on its basis is the outer effect. So the, the formula is the bridge in latency. Okay, well then here I'm giving a mathematical definition of the Antikarana. It's a mathematical relation among its constituent atoms. It's a resonant structure that allows for the transmission of consciousness from one dimension to another. Uh, if the mathematics of the Antikarana is not correct, there will be no alignment and no transmission. So one day I think we're going to see the Antikarana as a mathematical relationship, not just as some kind of imagined bridge of life. The frequencies of the different atoms involved will have to be rightly attuned to allow passage from above to below and below to above. Do you think it I think it already is a, manif a manifested condition on the higher planes. But as far as the physical Antikorana goes, we have some correspondences. We're told that there is a line of connection at the back of the skull to that. And um, I'm not sure where else there is in the relationship of the vocal cords a kind of antikarana uh, in the vocal co I'll, I'll explain that just briefly uh, for those who sing there is a kind of antikarana to be built in the vocal apparatus and um, it bridges register 
shifts. Now some of you have sung and you know that you have a high voice and you have a chest voice. You know, oh, you know, suddenly the, well we almost sang today. We, <laughs> we, uh, suddenly your voice changes into what's called chest voice. It's a heavier adjustment. Now no singer can go on the stage and have this high floaty voice and then when they get to the place, ah, uh, and, and shift crudely into the lower voice. Instead, vocal training, just to use the analogy, is building the vocal antikarana, allowing for a smooth transition between the registers so that part of the high voice goes into the low voice and vice versa. You bring your chest voice up into your middle register, you bring your middle register down into your chest voice. And the result is that you have this appearance of a smooth voice. Well, think of the register change between the concrete mind and the monastic uh, uh, abstract mind. There's a register shift. They're very different. But the advanced individual will be able to go from concrete to abstract and abstract to concrete smoothly because they've trained themselves over many years to build this bridge. <clears throat> and in these mathematical formulas lie hid the purpose, the quality, and the form of the completed structure and its eventual usefulness. So, I'm getting the impression of this. Mercury bridges fourth ray mathematics and the name of the fourth ray is one of them interesting the ray of the ray of mathematical exactitude <clears throat> dealing with the relation with the exact harmonious relation between frequencies so that there may be attunement. In other words, nothing's more exact, exacting than to make sure that frequencies synchronize and attune with each other so that harmony may be produced. Otherwise you have discord, out of tuneness, and so forth. So I, you know, I, when I first read that, that the fourth ray is the ray of mathematical exactitude, it didn't seem correct to me. Because everybody knows the third ray and the fifth ray are the mathematicians. But it's the exact harmony between spirit and matter. They need to be balanced. Yeah. With soul as a uh, equilibrizing intermediary, which has its own frequency as well. And, you know, every time you develop good relations with another person, you're doing a kind of a mathematical project. You don't know it because you do it kind of instinctively. But basically, the attunement between you uh, depends on the frequencies. And, and you know, let's just say uh, we get on the same wavelength or on harmonious wavelengths. All right. So it is with the concepts and the ideas which give birth to a thought form. Concepts are lower than ideas. All right, these are like formulas. These are, whoa, that's no good. Every once in a while you press the wrong button and there's problems. It gets warm in here, doesn't it? Amazing how warm it can get. These are like formulas. Okay. Okay. Michael? Yeah. What do you call it in English? The golden cross? No way you have this? The golden, um, you know the golden section? The golden mean? No. The golden mean. The golden mean. Yeah. 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 There, the, there's a certain Fibonacci series in mathematics that seems to be the formula behind the creation of many uh, objects of nature. 
So, you know, let's just say that God, the Creator, let's just say the Creator, the Creator has the formulas. And we see the results. But when the fourth, fifth, and seventh rays are all working together, uh, we will learn the formulas which create the divine beauty. Yeah. These occult formulas exist on the archetypal plane, which for the aspirant is the plane of the intuition. So, uh, this he's saying something very important here. The Buddhic plane is the archetypal uh, plane. But, it is not really. Really, it is the logoic plane. That's the true plane of causes and of archetypes. You could almost say that, for, you know, I'll just make a kind of an illustration. For the aspirant, it's the buddhic plane. For the disciple, it's the atmic plane. For the um, initiate, it's the monadic plane. And for the high initiate, it's the logoic plane. The whole realm of the cosmic ethers is archetypal. They have these subtle forms that tend to work out in matter. And matter is the mental, emotional, and physical plane. So, a state of consciousness far higher. Let's say, maybe uh, like this, maybe the sea of fire. These formulas underlie a world of forms and must be contacted by those who are duly equipped to work under the great architect of the universe. What ray is the great architect of the universe? Ray 3. The grand geometrician is Ray 2, and the great architect of the universe is Ray 3. But it's just our universe. Okay. You know, um, basically, <clears throat> go here. And uh, you see here the great architect of the universe under the names of the third ray Lord, also called the universal mind, and so forth. <clears throat> and then, you know, one of the important discriminations, what's the difference between the grand geometrician and the great architect of the universe? You know, between the second ray approach and the third ray approach. But let's just say that the grand geometrician gets the perfected idea on the buddhic plane, and the architect of the universe designs a more concrete form based on that perfect geometrical relationship and those and and what the architect designs takes into consideration what materials will be used and all the kinds of things that relate to the lower planes and the great geometrician grand geometrician doesn't have to do that grand geometrician is not worried about its precipitation it just wants the perfect model so the grand geometrician is archetypal and the great architect is even somehow closer to practical manifestation. From, a, from another point of view and a still higher point of view, uh, if I were to look at our little map here again, um, I would say that we can do it this way, that the the great architect of the universe is found on the atmic plane, which is a material plane. Material because it rules the number five, all, all five planes below. And the great geometrician is found on the second ray plane, which is the monadic plane. So that's one way of looking at their relationship. The other way is buddhic and higher manas, which is a lower reflection of the two. Okay. Uh, these formulas underlie a world of forms and must be contacted by those who are duly equipped to work under the great architect of the universe. Brahma. Brahma is the great architect of the universe. Uh, no. 
there are symbolically speaking three great books of formulas hmm symbolically note the words symbolically speaking and forget them not there is first the book of life read and eventually mastered by initiates of all degrees by the way you remember the part in esoteric astrology where he talked about the three books we'll talk about that in a minute then there is the book of divine wisdom read by aspirants of all degrees sometimes called the book of knowing experience and there is the book of forms which is compulsory reading for all in whom the intelligence is awakening to functioning activity and as with the book of forms we are not concerned well take a look at the three uh, tier circles of petals of the egoic lotus you could almost relate them in that way the knowledge petals related to the book of forms the love petals to the book of divine wisdom and the uh, sacrifice petals to the book of life or if you don't didn't want to do it that way you could say that all the nine petals are related to the book of forms the synthesis petals related to the book of divine wisdom and the jewel and the lotus related to the book of life but it's, it's the one, two, and three of it. Let's turn quickly to esoteric astrology and see what he says about the book of... Okay, that's the wrong one. Okay, here we go. The book of life initiates the twelve constellations. The book of wisdom disciples, the twelve planets, the book of form or of manifestation humanity, the twelve creative hierarchies, and I thought he would almost say the twelve houses. So I'll put that in here, page 23. Okay. Esoteric Astrology, page 23. Okay. Does that make sense to us? The Book of Life, the twelve constellations which are the heart in the head of the one about whom naught may be said. So that's the life aspect. The Book of Wisdom, the planets, every planet is called, oh gosh, every planet is called by the name Dragon of Wisdom. And then the Book of Form or Manifestation, Humanity and the Twelve Creative Hierarchies. Uh, the Twelve Creative Hierarchies deal with, um, they deal with the way monads are involved in forms. Okay. Patanjali speaks in one place of the rain cloud of noble things of which the soul is consciously aware. And there's a big hint there. Because if you want the precipitation of this rain cloud, you have to be in strong soul contact. Uh, the aspirant weary of the eternal round of his own futile and unimportant thoughts see eventually we do get tired of ourselves seeks to tap the resources of the rain cloud and so precipitate upon the earth some of the thoughts of God because there's also the rain cloud of unknowable things so um, uh, boredom is helpful for spiritual advancement. He seeks to work so that he can further the manifestation of the ideas of the Creator, and to do this he has to fulfill certain initial requirements which might be briefly stated as follows. So what are we doing here? We're, we are magically working out attributes which have been presented to us and we will present them to the world. 
know the meaning, the true meaning of meditation. Okay, so meditation precedes every act of divine creation. If you create without meditating, you're just throwing old stuff together. Meditation or creation without meditation is the combining of old things in an irrational manner. And so go back to the um, the attempt to create man by the lower spirits who did a bad job of it and along came the solar angels and had to destroy all that creation. They burned it all up. <laughs> There's this... Um, yeah. Uh, what, what would you say to you know, the artists when the others working on painting or writing music or whatever, um, they feel inspired to do whatever they do and yeah. they don't meditate. Well, you know, um, y- you are you are right about how that's done today and there's a fascinating section of Esoteric Psychology Volume 2 where DK talks about the meditative life of the artist of the future and I'll show you where it is basically uh, urge to the urge for the no, urge, urge Urge, creative, life. Um, the urge to creative life through the divine faculty of imagination. And in this section, around page 222, and going on for about seven or eight pages, um, DK, and especially page 246, D.K. talks about the need of the artist for occult meditation in order to receive to to perform truly occult art which has purpose and meaning and it's not just the expression of so much of their personality life but which reaches above and touches the impersonal world so No, no, and he will say that so much of it is personal and not what he means by the things to come. But occasionally, you know, people are very deep and they are attuned in some way and even though they don't meditate formally, um, as, as you know how it is with fourth rate people, they just don't like the formality of it all. They want spont- spontaneity. Uh, still something does come through. So here is this discussion from 246 to 250 and it's really worth uh, reading. The discipline involved is great and it is here that many artists fail. Their failure is based on various things, on the fear that the use of the mind will cripple endeavor and that spontaneous creative art is and must be primarily emotional and intuitive and must not be crippled and handicapped by too great an attention to mental training. See, he's talking about the, uh, how to build up the meditative life um, in the art- artistic type. And this is going to be a very big uh, field because the fourth ray monad is coming in with all of these fourth ray souls uh, along this line. Uh, The artist has to have three requirements, endurance, that's Vulcan, meditation and imagination, and if he has them, he will develop in himself the power to respond to this fourth rule of of soul control, and will know the soul eventually as the secret of persistence, the revealer of the rewards of contemplation and the creator of all forms upon the physical plane. So the artist eventually has to become the soul who is creating, the creative soul. And this is a very new 
kind of thought compared to how art is done uh, today uh, by, by many, although who's to say that some don't do that? Okay, so um, what, are we, what are we at? He seeks to work so that he can further the manifestation of the ideas of the Creator, and then he has to have certain requirements if he will further the ideas of the Creator if he will further the ideas of the Creator he must know the true meaning of meditation align with facility the soul, the mind and the brain this seems to be for everybody including, you know, all Creators alignment of soul, mind and brain contemplate <coughs> or function as the soul on its own plane wow in other words the creator must enter contemplation whereby says Alice Bailey he slips out of his own meditation and into the meditation of the soul very subtle thing one minute you're meditating as yourself the next minute you're meditating as the soul there's just been a subtle Neptunian change of scene and all of a sudden you realize that you are the soul meditating it then becomes possible for the soul to act as the intermediary between the plane of divine ideas let's call it the buddhic plane at this time and the mental plane you see how this matter of participation in the divine creative process works out as the objective of all true meditative work so he's saying we meditate meditate so that we can become uh, creative in the divine creative process okay and it's not that we try to uh, there are many meditations and many reasons for meditation but this is a cult meditation and DK seeks to make effective servers of us DK uh, seeks that we become effective servers therefore soul mind brain and we've done a lot of discussion about soul mind brain this time in our bringing down from the point in the causal body even touching booty down to the top of the head or down to the mental plane where it forms the thought form and down to the top of the head into the middle of the head into the middle of the etheric head into that magnetic field soul, mind, brain and then the pineal gland is also touched okay, what else has to be done? register the idea received by the soul intuitively and recognize the form which it should take the last seven words are of vital importance every time he uses the word vital I get suspicious it's not a casual use of the word it oftentimes is pointing us to some etheric necessity okay so if we don't recognize the form it should take we may get into illusion if we do not recognize uh, RCG we recognize the form it should take then we may be trapped by glamour and illusion a good idea badly expressed and thus ineffective okay what else is a requirement? reduce the vague and misty idea that's kind of interesting, it's the what you call nebular phase to its essentials discarding all vain imaginings and formulations of the lower mind and so equipping oneself to leap ready readily into activity through streamlining the essence 
of the idea to be realized. And through steadfastness and contemplation, receive accurately the vision of the <coughs> inner structure or the subjective skeleton, if I may so term it, of the form <coughs> which is to be. So, what's clear about this, this takes time. Now, you know, that's what he seems to say, steadfastness in contemplation. You might just get everything all at once somehow, and you know everything you have to do, but generally, if you're human and limited, you have to stay with an idea, stay with the idea, until it fills out. Fills out, and its intended internal structure is known. So that's another requirement. Reduce to essentials. Reduce the idea to its essentials. And get rid of the extraneous. Doesn't it also say that um, you should kind of keep yourself to the uh, inner core of the idea instead of uh, elaborating or thinking too much about it because then you, yeah. you uh, yeah. um, sort of... Um, yeah. Um, well, basically... Yeah. See, a lot of people, they, many, uh, get an idea and start elaborating immediately. Elaboration. Obviously, that's going to lead to many mistakes because the idea hasn't been refined, it hasn't been contemplated, the, so the core relations are not registered. Yeah. So it's just a question of timing and brooding upon the idea received. This uh, formula or inner structure, as recorded consciously by the soul upon the mind, is as consciously registered by the mind, held steady in the light, and might be regarded as the reduction of the formula to a blueprint. This is all kind of architectural language here. Of course, you know, it's the language of some 80 years ago. But even now, it's still, even though we have computer-assisted design and all the rest of it, um, some of the essentials are the same. So the blueprint um, makes the formula executable. Execute, executable. It gives you the essentials. It doesn't fill out all the details. The blueprint is a very abstract design. Uh, but it shows you exactly how to make the plan happen. So, blueprint deals only in essentials. And uh, removes many details that relate to uh, the what would you say that, that, that relate to additional aspects aspects of the design when you look at a blueprint you know something can be very beautiful with color and all the rest of it and you don't see that you just see the structural relations in a, a blueprint reveals structural relations, how things go together. Blueprint, sorry. Mm. Structural relations, how things fit together. Has anybody ever worked with blueprints? My uncle was in the air conditioning business for many years and um, they always had to go into places where they would set up air conditioning systems for businesses and whatever, go in the basement or whatever. They always worked from the blueprints exactly where to put things, how to connect things. It was the essence of how things went together. Mm. Yeah. 
You can. Blueprint is like the uh, structural essentials. Uh, it is. Um, it's the. It is the method of executing a more elaborate uh, design. It, it 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 is a step on the way into manifestation. It is not the formula itself, but secondary, but a secondary process. According to the strength, the simplicity, and the clarity of the embodiment of the formula in a simple outline structure, so will be the finally furnished, he uses interesting, he used that word, meaning it's got all the uh, uh, space filled in, the finally furnished building and the consequent form which will confine within the periphery of the outer form itself the lives used in its construction. So it's secondary, and it's got simplicity and clarity. It's the embodiment of the formula in a simple outline structure. That's the best way, that's a very good way of putting it. Okay. Well, I don't know, it, some of you when, you, when you prepare a talk, do you make an outline. It's the same idea. You may have in, in mind many things you want to say, but you just put down the essence, and that guides you as you construct the talk. Okay. This, in reality, resembles the stage of conception. <coughs> uh, I'll give it to you, Gisler, please. This, in reality, resembles the stage of conception. Latent within the germ, the result of male-female interrelation, lie all the potencies and capacities of the finished product. Latent within the idea which has been materially conceived, but which has been inspired by the spirit aspect, lie hid the potency, potencies of the finished thought forms. The matter aspect represented by the mind has been fecundated. Yeah, yeah, fecundated. Fecundated by the spirit aspect, and the triplicity will eventually be completed by the created form. But in the early stages, there is as yet only the formula, the conceived idea, the latent yet dynamic as concept. Yeah, dynamic concept. It has a uh, a livingness to it. Uh, dynamos dynamics relates to the first uh, aspect okay so you know the so called morphogenic field which is the etheric field the form uh, producing field uh, let's just say that there is an outline of there's an etheric outline of everything that will be elaborated uh, in physical matter an etheric outline of all that will be elaborated in dense physical plane matter. A very interesting, uh, now we're finding a bit more about where ideas come from. More about ideas. Um, he's basically saying not just from the realm of ideas or the soul, but from the spirit aspect. Uh, let's just say, from spirit to soul to mind to blueprint in the ethers to form. So let's take a look at that. Spirit, uh, uh, realm of ideas, put it, Soul, solar angel, mind, the outline, uh, ether, the physical um, template, and the dense physical form, the completed um, object. So, the spirit is the source of it all. 
there are expressions of the spirit in the spiritual triad that's considered the world of ideas from the world of ideas the soul or solar angel takes it up the man on the physical plane attunes himself to the solar angel and the mind is impressed with the outline of the idea then the physical brain, the ethers of the physical brain are impressed so that there is a material replication on the etheric plane of the mental plane, I, I thought, and then there finally follows the precipitation of the dense physical form. This is probably the magical process in a nutshell. Go ahead. The minor aspect represented uh, how we get, have we not read this before? Yes. It is potent enough to draw to itself the essentials for growth and form, yet who shall say whether it will prove an abortion, a mediocre and feeble product, or a creation of real beauty and value? Okay, so what is the it here? The conceived idea of the latent dynamic concept. It, or the conceived idea, or latent dynamic concept, is potent to draw the material it needs. And then we reinforce that, but there's so many stages in the magical process that we cannot know whether the idea will really work out. Like this, you've heard people say, great idea, but it didn't work out. And this might be related to the uh, Virgo, the sign Virgo and virgin birth. Mercury being the ruler, okay, and the process towards the esoteric ruler, the moon. Right, giving substance to the yeah. mm -hmm, so the birth Virgo and the birth process should here be considered. Ah, uh -huh. how conception, which is Mercury, moves towards embodiment, which is the esoteric moon in Virgo. And then finally, uh, as he says, the door of the womb uh, opens through Jupiter. And you have the uh, coming forth of the completed form. Now, it's very interesting about Jupiter has much to do with the lunar realm. Think about it with the lunar realm. Jupiter, exalted, in Cancer. Jupiter, hierarchical ruler of Virgo. Those are lunar signs. And, and, let's take it further. Jupiter, esoteric ruler, ruler of Aquarius, which, in which, the moon is exalted, is hierarchical ruler. So Jupiter has a lot to do with the physical plane. And that's why the speculation among us is that Jupiter has a potent seventh ray, which relates to the seventh plane. The thunderbolts that Jupiter throws relates to the first ray, and the embodiment in physical matter relates to the seventh ray, which Jupiter uh, brings in. Uh, let's see, John has just come, and let's see if we, where exactly we are here. Well, that's a lot of explanation. As a matter of fact, oh my goodness. I think we'll just read this one last paragraph, and then we will be happy to hear from John about his work here, in general and in Humlegar. Every externalized idea is therefore possessed of form, animated by desire, and created by the power of mind. The desire plane is the one upon which the mind imposes its conceptions in order to produce 
the idea incarnate or to clothe the idea in form. So we remember that uh, that if form, if, if desire is intense enough, there will be precipitation, provided the will does not fail. It is therefore the gestation ground, the desire plane, or the astral plane is the plane of gestation. The mind has previously been the recipient of the archetypal idea. So you ask yourself, is your idea really archetypal or is it just your idea? Are you representing the impersonal spheres or is it just something you dreamed up because personally it appeals to you? Obviously the first is more desirable. The mind <coughs> previously has been the recipient of the archetypal idea as grasped and visualized by the soul which, and the soul attunes itself to the universal mind. Mm-hmm. The soul uh, which attunes uh, no, <laughs> which attunes to the universal mind. In its turn, the soul is the recipient of the formula as presented to it in the world of ideas. See, although we think that the soul or the solar angel is the originator of our magical process, it too has its own sources of inspiration. So the world of ideas present the soul with the appropriate idea to be manifested. So you have the presented idea, the perceived idea, the formulated idea, and the idea working out into manifestation. The presented idea is from the plane of intuition, the buddhic plane. The idea is perceived by the soul, it is passed to the lower world where in the mind it is formulated into a blueprint and the formulated idea based on soul perceived formula, formula um, that has to be executed by the magician. The magician executes the formulated idea. Okay, well, we have, um, we've studied quite a bit about this magical process now. And remember what he says, a very interesting thing. He says that the scientific servers of the future who work on the fifth ray will cooperate with seventh ray workers and first ray workers to bring about a confirmation that the process of reincarnation is a fact. This will be their very first work. And their first work will also involve arranging for the idea which a human being is to appear in the proper uh, form in matter. So this is a very interesting thought for the future. Well, we'll see... Um, uh, we'll see if after John's talk we have any further time, but probably what we're going to do is to go into our meditation, which will close our work. So, John, I'd like to welcome you, and uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, you can come right up here. You have your computer, and hopefully, um, all you need to do is plug in. And yeah, I think we just need to plug it in. I think we just need to plug it in. I think we just need to plug it. In.